Okay, well, let me just give the, the briefest of, of introductions to Hushman, who I first met two years ago when he was giving some talks in the uh, summer school in Scotland, on, on the mainland, in Perthshire, which is very enjoyable uh, and uh, fantastic. And uh, if I can say, Hushman Badi is an academic economist with a doctoral degree in Baha'i economics, which is quite interesting, Baha'i economics. Hushman's two recent books are Economics and the Baha'i Faith, and I can even show you that we've actually got a copy which was very kindly donated <laughs> to, to Shetland by Hushman when he was... So anybody who would like to read that, they're very welcome to have a... Uh, to borrow the copy. Um, so the, um, Economics and the Baha'i Faith and Principles of Spiritual Economics, Spiritual Economics, a compilation from the Baha'i Writings with an overview of Baha'i economics. He has delivered talks and presented papers on economics and related subjects at numerous international academic conferences. Hushman has worked as a lecturer of economics for more than 25 years in several universities, mainly in the West Indies and the UK. He is currently a faculty member at the Wilmette Institute in the uh, United States and an academic member of the Baha'i Institute for Higher Education in Iran. Of course, that's uh, not actually living in Iran, but he does it through the internet. He also offers an enterprise training program for the refugees coming to Scotland, which I didn't know, which is lovely, all on a voluntary basis. So without any further ado, I'd like to warmly welcome Hushman. Please do. Go yeah. ahead. Well, thank you very much, Robert. Thank oh, you. Welcome. Very welcome. Yeah. Thank you for having me. And uh, uh, it is a, a pleasure to be with friends in, in, Ler in Lerwick. Um, with your permission, I am going to share my PowerPoint now. And we start uh, from there. Um, just take a couple of seconds. Okay, Majan, everything is okay? Yes, looks great, thank you. Uh, okay. All right, thank you very much. Uh, well, um, the title of this uh, presentation, as you see, uh, is uh, Can Our Economic System uh, Ever Become ethical. Well, friends, when we ask this question, the immediate response should be which type of economic system we are talking about. Uh, two main economic systems that are known to us and in operation in last 200 years. Uh, one is the free market economy with political term capitalism, with minimum government intervention, and the other one is a mixture of socialism and communism with the political term command economy uh, and uh, with maximum government intervention. Um, both of them are mainly the outcome of the industrial revolution in 18th century. And both have gone through major changes. The current economic systems that are not um, the, the one really that written by uh, and, and envisioned by Adam Smith, the Scottish philosopher and economist uh, and the founder of the free market economy and Karl Marx, the founder of command economy. Now for this short presentation, I'm going to focus on mainly free market economy that is relevant to us and we see how we can bring ethics to this system. And uh, of course, uh, uh, fixing this uh, system depends on the extent uh, to which ethical principles are used as the basis for market regulation. 
Um, in my presentation, I try my best to not use technical terms. I don't want to, uh, uh, to change this uh, beautiful uh, meeting into a, a economic class. Uh, but if I use uh, then please uh, later on during the question and answer and comments, uh, um, please ask. But I try my best not to use uh, uh, too many uh, technical terms. Um, my main point in this presentation uh, is that the theoretical representation of the free market economy that rely on markets alone is unrealistic. In other words, the theory states that all participants of the market are rational maximizers and the market reach to a balanced position in the long run. For me, this is a fantasy. This did not happen and will never happen. The key terms such as income and happiness and commodities that are used by a conventional um, economist and mainstream economics are obviously important. But to help fixing free market economic system, these terms need to be redefined. Why, for example, the income of some of the chief executives are several thousand times more than their own employees working at the same organization? Why, as the level of income increases, happiness declines? And why so many commodities that are harmful and destructive and unnecessary are still produced in this free market economy. Here in this slide, the top picture is one example of growing the gap between high income group and low income group in this system. It shows that the top 1% of world population own 50% of the share of global wealth, and the other 99% of the population own the other 50% of the share of the global wealth. The lower picture shows that in one hand, absolute poverty has declined in last 200, in last actually two, three decades. And on the other hand, the gap between the rich and the poor has increased. And uh, we see uh, that the poor are not getting actually poorer, at least in, the, in most places, but the rich are getting richer and richer faster and causing widening the gap between the rich and the poor. Hence, uh, currently 80% of the world resources are in the hands of 20% of world population. One of the prominent economists uh, called Alfred Marshall has defined economics as the study of human behavior in a normal way of life. Now, I don't know when we see these pictures over here, whether they are considered as a normal way of life. These pictures and hundreds and thousands more that shows that economic disparity and miserable condition of living is not acceptable and is not a normal way of life. When Abdul Baha, the son of the founder of the Baha'i faith, Baha'u'llah, and the center of the covenant and his uh, interpreter uh, visited the first, and by West I mean Europe and America, witnessed the condition of disparity of wealth and poverty. And in one of his writings, uh, we read this. He said, although the body politic is one family, yet because of the lack of harmonious relations, some members are comfortable and some in direct misery. Some members are satisfied and some are hungry. 
Some members are clothed in most costly garments and some families are in need of food and shelter. And then he asked this question, why? And he responded, because this family lacks the necessary reciprocity and symmetry. This household is not well arranged. This household is not living under a perfect law. All the laws which are legislated do not ensure happiness. They do not provide comfort. Therefore, the law must be given to this family by means of which all the members of this family will enjoy equal well-being and happiness. So now, friends, I'm going to talk briefly here about the cycle of production of this free market economy and the challenges that we are having and uh, with this phase, especially this phase of the uh, cycle of production. Let's uh, start with needs and wants. Close to 8 billion people in the world every day require goods and services all the time. How much we need and how much we want is based on our purchasing power and our willingness and ability to pay for it. This phase of the economy is suffering from the choice of needs and wants of those selfish and greedy and lazy consumers with little or no consideration to other people and other places and no regards to preserving the ecosystem. Then organizations are established to respond to our needs and wants. Now, profit motive and its maximization is the main objective of these organizations. They use a variety of techniques to reduce their cost and increase their profit. And they do anything to achieve this. Examples include exploitation, discrimination, paying low wage, paying fewer taxes, having easy access to cheaper natural resources, and causing environmental damage with no responsibility to fix it. The wealth of some of these organizations known as multinational corporation is bigger than the entire wealth of a country. This is a quote about ethical business stated by Baha'u'llah, the founder of the Baha'i Faith. And I request Mandy, please read this quote, uh, if you are willing. Commerce is the heaven, whose sun is trustworthiness and whose moon is truthfulness. The most precious of all things in the estimation of him who is the sovereign truth is trustworthiness. Thus it hath been recorded in the sacred scroll of God. Entreat ye the one God to enable all mankind to attain to this most noble and lofty station. Thank you very much, Len Mandy. Now, we go to another phase, and the products that are produced by those organizations then uh, in basically introduce these, these organizations respond to our uh, um, needs and wants. And a number of these products that are produced by a variety of organizations are actually unnecessary. They are destructive and they are damaging to our health and to our natural environment. Uh, the main market for some of these products are mainly uh, for, the, for the rich people and for the rich countries. Um, in this passage, Abdul Baha is talking about the proper and effective use of economic resources, including human and natural resources. Uh, once again, Mandy, would you please read this one? No government would need continually to pile up the weapons of war, nor feel itself obliged to produce ever new military weapons with which to conquer the human race. In this way, the entire population would, 
first of all, be relieved of the crushing burden of expenditure currently imposed for military purposes. And secondly, great numbers of people would cease to devote their time to the continual devising of new weapons of destruction, those testimonials of greed and bloodthirstiness so inconsistent with the gift of life, and would instead bend their efforts to the production of whatever will foster human existence and peace and well-being and would become the cause of universal development and prosperity. Thank you very much, Mandy. And of course here, Abdul Baha is talking only about one type of uh, production, which is military output. There are hundreds of different kinds of goods and services that are damaging, they are not necessary, and causing uh, neuro numerous problems for, for us, for humanity, for environment as well. Then these products enter to the market. The market uses all kinds of techniques to attract customers and to sell products, including misleading advertisements and aggressive competition. For an effective relationship between all participants in the market, ethics or morality becomes a key principle for the operation of a successful economy. The Baha'i writings emphasize that cooperation and not competition is the cause of life in society, just as the life of an organism is maintained by cooperation of the various elements of which it is composed. This is another quote from Abdul Baha that is talking about use of cooperation instead of competition. Yes, please, Mandy. The greatest foundation of the world of existence is this, cooperation and mutuality. The more the world aspires to civilization, the more this most important matter of cooperation and assistance becomes manifest. Therefore, in the world of humanity, one sees this matter of helpfulness attain to a high degree of efficiency, so much so that the continuance of humanity entirely depends upon this interrelation. Thank you very much. Now, the function of the market is distribution. Distribution is based on people's ability to pay. This is the most unjust and unfair part of this free market capitalism. This is the part that has led to increasing the gap between the rich and the poor. The rational choice theory of the free market economy states that people are rational thinkers and they know what's best for them and the market balanced itself in the long run. However, in practice, it's a different story. Balancing the market, as I said before, is a fantasy. The fact that tonight more than a billion people go to bed hungry is a sign that the market is not balancing itself. In his writing, Baha'u'llah is encouraging and instructing the rich people to take care of the poor, including this one. Mandy, please. O oh, children of dust, tell the rich of the midnight sighing of the poor, lest heedlessness lead them into the path of destruction and deprive them of the tree of wealth. To give and to be generous are attributes of mine. Well is it with him that adorneth himself with my virtues. Thank you very much. And finally is the phase of consumption. In some parts of the world, consumption is so much that they had to come up with the idea of recycling to get rid of the wastage. The consumer society has led to the consumerism, and this is another big challenge of our time. Consumerism is spreading to every part of the world, even in developing countries. Consumption is more than just utility maximization. Utility achieved through a more complex process. It is more than just involving having an income. It depends how that income is earned and how it is used 
and for what type of goods and services is used. Every time I go to the market to buy something, I have to ask myself if what I am buying is necessary, if what I am buying harm the environment, or does my action causing poverty somewhere else? At all times, I have to keep in mind the end and means, and whether the right means is used to achieve that. It should noted also that individual is not simply a self-interested economic unit trying to claim a greater share of the world's material resources. Let's see what the Baha'i writing says here. And this is another quote from Baha'u'llah. Uh, Mandy, please. Man's merit lieth in service and virtue and not in the pageantry of wealth and riches. Take heed that your words be purged from idle fancies and worldly desires, and your deeds be cleansed from craftiness and suspicion. Dissipate not the wealth of your precious lives in the pursuit of evil and corrupt affection, nor let your endeavours be spent in promoting your personal interests. Thank you very much. So, by devoting ourselves to the service of others, we find meaning and purpose in life and contributes to the upliftment of society itself as well. So friends, there is a crisis in every phase of this market. And the story of the inconsistency of the free market economy or the free market capitalism is not finished yet. It is expected to be with us for some time before it can be fixed. Of course, most capitalists are aware of these challenges and they are aware that the time has come to either fix it or to end it. So who should be blamed here? The free market capitalism or the participants of the free market capitalism? It can be argued that capitalist is only one part of the problem. The other part of the problem is linked to the rest of the cycle of production, including consumers, shareholders, financial institutions, government and government agencies, sellers, marketers, manufacturers, educational institutions, families, and religious institutions, etc., etc. All of them are responsible and contribute to the crisis of the free market capitalism. In other words, we are all a part of it, directly or indirectly. We cannot separate ourselves from this market. We are in it every day. And because we are a part of it, we should be also a part to fix it. So it is possible to manage the free market capitalism through a transformation process by using, for example, moderation in our needs and wants, social function of wealth be considered by organizations using sustainable products. And here I have to mention what I mean by sustainable and sustainability and sustainable development. This term of sustainable uh, and sustainability uh, was uh, introduced around 1970s, especially in the writings of uh, United Nations and became very popular. Uh, and, and the definition of the sustainable development is to produce products that benefit us and also benefit the future generation and also not causing damage to our environment. So those are the three conditions of sustainability or sustainable product. In fact, the Baha'i writings, uh, although not using the same uh, term, but, the, but the, the features and the definition of sustainable development are in the writings of, uh, uh, of the Baha'i faith. And then we use cooperation in the market 
We also use fairness and justice in distribution and our consumption become also sustainable. These short-term solutions will bring the free market economy out of its serious crisis. This way, we can manage the true meaning of the market, which is the relationship between people attending the market and not between products. Now, for this topic to become more meaningful, we need to uh, redefine also the term ethical and spirituality. Uh, we need to redefine spirituality in a way that comprises the entire humanity, including those who for various reasons try to get distance from religion and consider themselves secular thinkers. In other words, they consider themselves spiritual, but not affiliated to any organized religion. Although for uh, the members of different faiths, um, also uh, Baha'is uh, spirituality is closely connected to religion. But for the sake of this presentation and this discussion, I'm going to separate spirituality from religion to include everyone, including those getting distance from religion. So the scripture view is that all humans are gifted with a higher nature, but it needs to be nurtured and developed. It is this all unifying function of spirituality that helps to resolve difficulties when we come face to face with problems. The belief in the higher nature of human being also has a closer correlation with the purpose of life for a believer. The purpose of life is not simply the satisfaction of one's own needs and enjoyment of material pleasures, but also involves service to one's community and also to the wider society. A similar interpretation of the concept of spirituality as a unifying factor is given by Professor David Hay, uh, who was a professor of child psychology at Aberdeen University in Scotland. According to him, secular thinkers and social scientists are able to recognize spirituality and spiritual principles when they come face to face with problems. Therefore, spirituality has a unifying function and it doesn't matter what kind of belief we are having, we recognize the spiritual principles when we come face to face with problems. And here I'm going to mention a few examples uh, to, to, to clarify my point uh, about the concept of spirituality. The first one is a few examples of current crisis that we are having. We all remember global financial crisis of 2008 that led to the recognition of spiritual principles. It is now believed that the root cause of global financial crisis of 2008 was not money, but the absence of honesty and trustworthiness and truthfulness and mismanagement of money in the financial institutions. Another example is European economic crisis that led to the recognition of a need for political unity among member states. The European leaders coming face to face with the recent financial and political crisis led them to realize that the root cause of problems is not the euro currency, but the self-interest of member states, mismanagement of money and absence of political unity among themselves. Also, as social scientists come face to face with ecological problems, spiritual principles are recognized. World leaders were invited by the UN and gathered several times to consult about environmental issues. They agreed that international issues such as the environment 
require all nations to consult, to cooperate, to show respect, and to take care of the planet. They agreed that this requires a great deal of moral and spiritual maturity. And about the question of refugees, when the rich and developed countries faced with the current surge of refugees, started to show a level of compassion and welcoming them to have a better life. They have realized a positive potential in refugees. With appropriate policies, this rich source of human capital can be harnessed with benefits for everyone. And also coming face to face with the problem of poverty at the global level, the rich people and nations have recognized the need to show compassion and caring to bring the poor out of poverty. As a result, absolute poverty has declined by about five to 600 million people in the past few decades. And according to the UN, it is expected to be eliminated totally by 2030. Of course, it all depends how the poverty is declined, whether the intention is to eradicate poverty, in other words, wipe out totally, or to eliminate it, and that means to reduce it, or just to control it, and that means keeping it at the same level. Now, here, friends, I'm using a, a model, it's called the input-output model, as another method for the application of ethical and spiritual solution to our economic problems. The model shows the process of converting inputs, which are mainly economic resources, to produce output, which are mainly goods and services. Now, we can choose to use all the resources available to us to make those products that are destructive and harmful and unnecessary to humans, to animals, and to nature, or we can choose to use resources to produce products that are necessary and sustainable and beneficial to us. Now, once spiritual and ethical principles such as truthfulness and trustworthiness and honesty and compassion is added to the process of transferring input into output, the choices of producing goods and services become constructive, useful, sustainable, and appropriate for human dignity. For the input output to make sense, we have to agree that spiritual principles must be considered as another resource and be added to the input section. This can be one of the most effective ways of stopping vestige of the planet's precious resources. It is this way of thinking that the idea of ethical economics makes sense. The Universal House of Justice, the supreme governing body of the Baha'i faith, uh, states that economic life is an arena for the expression of honesty, integrity, trustworthiness, generosity, and other qualities of the spirit. So it is possible to fix the free market economy and capitalism through a transformation process by using ethics in all phases of the free market economy. For example, consumers accept moral obligation to consume products that are sustainable. Firms accept moral obligations to produce products that are demanded by responsible consumers. Government accept moral obligation to provide good governance and parents teach their children moral obligation about the purpose of life. Therefore, if we want to try to fix the current economic system, we have to start with its 
participants, with the actors of the economy. We cannot do this overnight, of course, but that's the only way. Maintaining such a high standard of moral conduct in all aspects of the economy requires to create a type of culture where it would be easy to apply these principles. And these will become more effective if our children and junior youths are raised with moral education along with knowing the purpose of wealth and the purpose of life. Now with this COVID-19, of course, we feel more united uh, wherever we live than ever before, even at a distance. The truth of the unity of humankind is recognized by an increasing number of people and any economic system of the future must be based on unity and interconnectedness of people and nations of the world. During this period of COVID-19, wonderful things have happened that are signs of true altruistic and ethical nature of human beings. And this is demonstrated by hundreds of business organizations as a part of transforming input into output based on ethical principles. Here I have uh, noted only a few examples. For example, a number of tobacco companies have invested in researching for the development of vaccine for the coronavirus. A number of fashion designers companies have also invested in making personal um, protective equipment. A number of car manufacturers are making ventilators for hospitals. A number of alcohol brewers are investing and making uh, antiseptic hand sanitizers. And a number of five-star hotels have offered their kitchens to the small res restaurants to use and stay in the market. And a number of hotels have also made their rooms available for the frontline workers so that they can protect their families by not going back home after long shifts. So friends, these and many more profit-based organizations and not profit organizations have a positive impact on the world by contributing an enormous amount of their resources to help their present condition. And this is another way of making our free market economy and our, our economic system more, more ethical by using the analogy of human family as a system. Now, the phrase human family in the Baha'i writings is based and used to show the entire humanity. It is stated, for example, that the world of humanity has been described as a unit, as one family. Also, it is stated, we are all inhabiting one globe of the earth. In reality, we are one family, and each one of us is a member of this family. We must all be in the greatest happiness and comfort. The use of the analogy of the family in economic activities is helpful uh, given the similarities between the features and the structure of a family and those of economics. The family unit as a system offers an ideal setting within which can be shaped those moral attributes that contribute to an appropriate view of economics and perhaps creating an economic system based on principles that working within a family. Now, let's do some analysis of this idea of the analogy of the, of the family. Looking at the similarities of the nature of the family unit and its relationship with the larger society, and also looking at those beautiful principles that are working within a family, 
the question we should ask is, why such beautiful principles are not working in the wider society? For example, in the family unit, with very limited resources, the weaker numbers or weaker members of the family, mostly children, are under extreme care. How come tonight, as we are speaking, over a billion people in the world go to bed hungry? Or in the family unit, the resources are shared among the members on the basis of equity. How come today in the wider society, 80% of the world resources are in the hands of only 20% of the population and the gap is increasing? Or in the family unit, most attractive or most activities are based on cooperation. How come in the wider society, it is based on aggressive and relentless competition? Also in the family unit, members sacrifice their own well-being for the happiness of other members of the family. But in the wider society, it is based on self-interest and even worse, selfishness. So responding to these questions, we may agree that the larger society, our activities and behavior are based on models and systems that are currently used and they are mostly obsolete or outdated. Another issue related to the subject of family is the role of children. Generally speaking, when we talk about economics, most people think it is a university subject or it is a subject that leaders of society and big organizations should talk about. Of course, without ignoring its importance at the university level and at the organizational level, I think some of the economic ideas have an important place at the family level to be discussed. I will just mention a few examples here, but it requires, of course, a whole session to talk about. Children, for example, must have some idea about the role and purpose of economics, which is about tools available to us to use them wisely for living a happy life. Children should become familiar and know, for example, the importance of savings, the importance of work, the relationship between income and expenditure. Children should have some idea about good cost and bad cost and why bad costs are bad for the environment. The concept of money. Does money bring happiness? And what is happiness? What is the purpose of life? What is moderation? And why it should be exercised in all aspects of life? And many, many other topics that are related to economics and its actual place is in the family for parents and children to learn together. And these are friends, uh, samples of hundreds of drawings by children and the message to coronavirus is that don't kill my friends. I love everyone. These are strong messages from very young children. These children in 20, 30 years will enter to the different parts of the society as important players in public and private sectors. With the new consciousness that is developing with our younger generation, they will make decisions that are based on the reality of love and compassion for the entire humanity. These children have a desire to contribute to the construction of a better world. Therefore, friends, any economic system of the future must be universal, ethical, and flexible. Flexible in a sense that one size fits all 
will not be appropriate because economic resources, including human and natural resources, are not the same in different places. Universal in a sense that the well being and happiness of all must be achieved. And ethical because market economy is about relationship between people. And anytime we talk about relationship, the foundation need to be ethical principles, such as honesty, truthfulness, and trustworthiness. In a market, the relationship is not between prices and commodities. The relationship is between buyers and sellers. Humans are in a relationship. Therefore, ethics become an essential requirement for any economic transaction. And these are some of the features of Baha'i economics of the future as a part of the new world order of Baha'u'llah. And Baha'u'llah revealed his new world order while being a prisoner in the city of Akka. And as a prisoner, he advocated teachings that promotes the betterment of the world, the well being of nations, and the happiness of nations. So, friends, I hope this short uh, introduction, in fact, about uh, ethical economics and about uh, requirements of ethical and spiritual principles to fix our free market economy or any other system of economics uh, was uh, uh, beneficial and, and helpful. Thank you very much for having me once again. And I stop here. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much, Shushman. That's fantastic. You're welcome. You're welcome. Thank you very much. I mean, uh, there's no doubt about it that um, money is a very uh, difficult thing sometimes, you know, and it can cause a lot of problems. So it's lovely if we can spiritualize our approach to it, you know, and I think actually the faith will, as it, as it uh, you know, gains more, uh, you know, people hearing about it, will, it will have a good effect on us. So we won't think of money as a bad thing, but, <laughs> but you know, money is the root of all evil is one of the things you often hear. <laughs> But uh, really, it's not, you know, uh, it's just the way that you approach it, which is very nice. And thank you for sharing all those wonderful thoughts. Lovely, lovely. You're welcome. Thank you very much.